Super. Well, good evening, everyone. It's lovely to see you here. A nice, small, select crowd, uh, but you just about are more than us by double in number. So very nice to see you. And if anyone can hear us outside, they're very welcome to join us as well. Uh, I know that this is also being live streamed, so um, hello to anyone who's watching online as well. Uh, my name's Graham Ross, and I'm a fellow at Clare College, Cambridge, and I'm also the director of music there. And it's a great joy for me to bring Clare College Choir here this evening. If you're a regular attendee at concerts here at the Music Centre, um, you may have seen the alumni from Clare College Choir a few years back. I brought an octet here to do a performance uh, a few years ago, as well as um, a wonderful collaboration we had with the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment uh, a few years back, where we performed uh, Haydn's and Nelson Mass with John Butt and the OAE and 16 of my alumni. Um, but this evening on stage, um, I'm joined by four members of the choir of Clare College, and you're going to see another 22 of them turn up at 7.30, and you'll be relieved to hear that all of us, myself included, will be even more smartly dressed at 7.30, but we thought we'd go for a relaxed approach for you today. So maybe the first thing I can do is just to um, ask our uh, members of the choir just to introduce themselves briefly and tell us a little bit about what they do at Cambridge. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Nick. I'm a PhD student in music at Clare, specialising in 19th century Russia. Hi, my name is Helen. I studied undergraduate music at York and now I work for the choir as the choir administrator. <laughs> Hi, I'm Julian. Um, I'm a second bachelor's degree student, so a postgrad undergrad um, in the second year studying uh, theology at Cambridge. Hi, uh, I'm Meg. I'm the Alto Lay Clerk this year. Uh, I studied music at Cambridge. I graduated in 2021 and I'm now in the process of applying for PhDs in music. So, as you can see, our choir is made up of uh, predominantly undergraduates, but we have a number of graduates in the choir as well. And uh, as I said, you, there are about 26 of us, I think, in the choir. And that number fluctuates per year. I don't have any fixed abode as to how many should. Um, should be in the choir each year. Sometimes it's more than that, sometimes it's a little bit less. And what we thought would be useful for you today ahead of this evening's concert is to tell you a little bit about tonight's programme and some of the thoughts that I had in putting it together, but also just to give you a little bit um, of, of an insight into what it is to being a member of Clare College and indeed a member of Clare College Choir. So maybe I begin a little bit about the programme itself. So we've called this evening's concert A Spotless Rose. And much of the repertoire that you're going to hear us perform this evening is indeed based on this idea of a rose, which for many years has held symbolism and imagery um, attached, of course, to Mary. We have this Marian uh, theme in things like Essistein Rosensprungen. And we've had for many, many centuries over the years composers who've been inspired by this theme of a rose, the spotless rose, a tender shoot, Essistein Rosensprungen, etc. And so what I've done in this evening's programme is to take a number of different composers who've responded to that theme and to those particular texts. And sometimes you hear them next door to each other, so you can uh, have a juxtaposition uh, in real time, and other times we hear some in the first half, some in the second half of the programme. But the first piece that you're going to hear us perform uh, a little bit later is one of the great O antiphons. And these are the plain chant antiphons that were traditionally sung either side of the Magnificat in the church on the seven days leading up to Christmas. And in fact, a little bit later this month, I'm going to be taking Clare College Choir on tour to the Netherlands. And we're actually going to be performing on all of the relevant days that the O antiphons relate to. So this evening, we are a little bit early to be performing O Sapientia. It should be done on something like the 21st of December, but I hope you'll forgive us doing it a little bit early for you today. And the antiphons, as you'll hear, are simply plain chant. They're just sung by a, a single line. There's no accompaniment, there's no harmony as such. And what we like to do in our concerts here at Clare is to open things with um, something rather simple like that. And you'll see that we'll process on. And gradually, the music will unfold into um, four-part harmony, and sometimes even more than that. And maybe I'm going to hand over to Meg just to explain a little bit about um, what you're going to hear after that O antiphon this evening with the Vulpius and the Pretorius. Gosh, yes. <clears throat> I mean, after you hear the, it's the tenors and basses that will take the, that will 
take O Sapientia. And then uh, you'll hear in, in four parts our, our sopranos are split, and they'll come in with the, the Volpius um, setting, which is also incredibly beautiful. I'll speak louder. There you go. <laughs> um, yes, incredibly beautiful, uh, and, and they'll also slowly come on. And then finally, uh, very c cleverly, because it's all, all in related keys, uh, all, then the whole choir will come together to sing the Pretorius uh, Est ist ein Ross entsprungen, which is a, you know, a, a favourite of everyone's, I think. It, it's one of my favourites for Christmas, certainly, and it might be one that people here and people watching on the live stream recognise. So, yes. And then following that in the programme, we have a, a, a kind of family pairing. We can think of some famous composers over time who've been husband and wife or brother and sister. We think of Robert and Clara Schumann, for example. But this evening, we're going to do brother and sister. We're going to hear a piece of Fanny Mendelssohn and a piece of Felix Mendelssohn. And the first one is Fanny Mendelssohn. And this is a piece that she wrote um, just aged 18 called Gebet in der Christnacht. And you'll hear Clare College Choir's impeccable German. So you won't need to look at the translation, but should your German be a little bit rusty, it's there for you in the program. And this is a really beautiful, I think, beautiful carol, um, originally written as a song, but I've arranged it for soprano alto tenor basses in the choir. And it tells of a story. I wonder if someone else here wants to describe a little bit about the angel Esther. Um. Yeah, I, th I think I, I particularly like sort of singing these and the other German carols. So my, my first undergrad degree was in German literature, so it's sort of nice to like, you know, look at the German text. Um, so the, the first verse sort of talks about, funny enough, not the birth of Christ, but about um, the cross and sort of the, and the crucifixion. Um, so I think it's interesting, and I think that it shows up in later parts of the programs as well. Um, sort of the like the idea of Christmas um, already looking forward sort of to other events um, in the life of Christ um, but then sort of by the third verse we are sort of back in the land more of, of, of traditional Christmas imagery um, and we hear um, an angel sort of asking if uh, Christ is is born and is is, is Christ sort of the savior um, so you you get sort of a, a interesting kind of trajectory of the Christmas story told through a different kind of lens, not starting necessarily um, with the angels and the Annunciation to the Shepherds, as we might think of it, but sort of um, with later events. Um, and there's a carol that we sing later, well, not really a carol by Tchaikovsky, um, that sort of plays with that similar sort of imagery um, of, of roses, not sort of as roses, but as, as drops of blood. Um, so I think it's interesting sort of with Christmas looking at the ways in which, I don't know, we, we don't always see the traditional imagery we might associate with the season. I knew that question would be answered best by someone studying theology. That's excellent, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, we think of lots of Christmas imagery, all the things that we, we associate with this time of year, the wise men as we head towards Epiphany. We're going to hear a really beautiful um, a kind of musical evocation of the wise men in Felix Mendelssohn's um, extract from his oratorio Christus. And this evening, the three um, gentlemen in the choir who represent the wise men uh, come from, from very, very far away, uh, even beyond Jerusalem, because in fact, one of them is Australian uh, and the other two are American. So the, these are extremely well-traveled wise men before they get to the major. And, um, I think it's interesting this time of year, we, of course there are so many wonderful carols which you'll hear some of this evening, some of them you'll hear in different arrangements. Uh, I think of, for example, a, a really beautiful setting we're going to sing for you called In the Bleak Midwinter, which of course is a carol that we know well from Christina Rossetti's text. Uh, and we probably know it best in the version set by Gustav Holst. Um, you'll hear the melody of that today, but you'll hear it in an arrangement by the Norwegian composer Ole Jelo. And it's written for two choirs, and Maggie, who's one of our sopranos, sings stratospherically high in the last verse. And it's this wonderful, I think, image of a kind of snow-capped snow landscape uh, with this, I don't know, something very kind of crystalline in the texture. Um, it's a really, really beautiful kind of reinterpretation of a very traditional carol. And maybe I can ask Helen, when we get to this time of year, we as musicians are perhaps 
a little bit guilty of going on autopilot when we come to our kind of 14th Hark the Herald Angels Sing by the time it's only December the 5th. And um, what do you think, Helen, it is that we as musicians do to kind of keep this season special and, um, you know, special to us as well as performers, as well as for our audience? I think as a musician, one of the best ways to try and keep the season as special for you as possible is to still just try and find some joy in the story that you're telling, whether that's in the Mendelssohn or in any of the pieces that we're singing, there's still all of this Christmas imagery and just as a singer on stage, you need to be performing to the best of your ability. And so just performing the piece and performing the story. And I think one thing that's so nice about doing the This Spotless Rose program quite a few times over the next couple of weeks is that we, we're now at a point where we know the music, we know what the notes are going to do, they're not going to run away from us, hopefully, so we can just uh, kind of stand there on stage and tell all of you watching and listening the story. Because I, I think it's worth saying that when we're in our home environment in Cambridge, in our chapel, traditionally and typically we sing the music of choral Ebensong, and that's by far the thing that we do the most. We sing that three times every week during the academic terms. And whilst there are kind of some sometimes kind of special services like Eucharists or Complins or things for Ash Wednesday and Advent, you know, all the important parts of the liturgical year, the, the kind of bread and butter of what we do is choral Ebensong. So actually, certainly for me as director of the choir, this particular time of year is a particularly special one because we get to perform a program a number of times. And of course, you will be receiving the very best performance this evening because every performance has to be better than the one before. I really mean that. Um, but what's unusual for us is that we do, as Helen says, we have this opportunity to really finesse a program. Whereas in our chapel, we very rarely repeat repertoire. So the students in the choir typically sing in every choral even song, an introit, an anthem, a Magnificat, a Nunc Dimittis, a Psalm, a hymn, a setting of the pre-season responses. So that's seven different things every service. The organ scholars top and tail those services with a voluntary each. And so with those kind of nine different parts, we very rarely repeat three services a week, 27 pieces a week, eight weeks per term. You're better at maths than I am. We're singing about 200 pieces per academic term. Three academic terms per year, three years of a typical undergraduate degree. You can expect to graduate from Clare having sung something like 1,500 pieces, which is a kind of baffling statistic when you think of it. But it, I hope, opens my students' eyes and ears to a whole range of repertoire, things that they're obviously familiar with to some extent, and definitely some things that will be new to them. And that doesn't just mean a new commission, but it does sometimes mean that, but it also means pieces that are perhaps lesser familiar in the repertoire. So maybe I can ask Nick a leading question and say, now that you've finished your first term in Clare College Choir, what would you say from a repertoire point of view has been your highlight? Ooh, from a repertoire point of view, um, I think more than repertoire, um, this like event particularly um, is our second advent um, service. Um, so in Clare Choir and Graham likes to program a lot of very new and contemporary works which are all very interesting um, and you know it gets us, uh, it really improves our, our ability to read music really quickly and you know learn some music and share the new music with the people who are there to listen to them. Um, the advent service, how it goes is we have uh, a, like a carol, a hymn and then an antiphon and then the whole the whole thing repeats for like six or seven times. Um, but then, uh, so th this year particularly, there were a lot of quite new pieces. Um, but a highlight, I think, was that it finishes off with Rachmaninoff's uh, Borgaditsia Dieva. Um, and so it, it almost feels like it's part of the whole thing because you, you go on this journey of uncertainty. Even for us singers, sometimes we might not even get to that level of you know, being familiar with the music. But then we end off with something that's very familiar and uh, perhaps not just for singers, but also for the audience. And it just sort of uh, gives us a sense of relief and you know, it feels like we've arrived somewhere, somewhere familiar. So that has been quite a particular highlight of the, um, for, for the term and being Claire Choir. And would our four members of the choir on the stage be able to say their favourite piece in this evening's programme? How's Spotless Rose? 
That Absolutely, was quick. Always. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, oh, it's just, it's. I mean, it's always been my favourite piece to sing at Christmas, and I've and I've actually rarely sung it. I think it's probably the second time ever since. You know, it's in the ten years that I've been singing that I've actually sung it properly in a concert. And it, it's, it's that very, the very ending where you get the, it's the, the the first alto B against the soprano C natural. That that clash is just gorgeous and I think there's a special thing about Howells like every single you know, especially with the endings of his pieces he never tries to you know there's no similarities he always tries to make it different and you see it especially with his uh, his canticles the settings of all of his canticles the, the Magnificat and the Nunc Dimittis when you get the big the big glory as the doxology never ever do you see any similarities always tries to make it completely different and yeah I just oh, I think it's brilliant so good and our soloist in the spotless rose this evening is Julian. Yes. He's the guy who takes the solo. What's your favourite piece in today's programme, Julian? Um, it's actually probably not a spotless rose, I mean, because I'm very nervous by that point. <laughs> um, mine is probably actually, um, we're, we're doing um, uh, this piece called uh, Loop Book Lullaby. Um, and I don't know, I think there's something about the, it, it sort of has a little bit of a, I know, somewhat dissonant jazzy quality to it. Not super dissonant, but I, I, I think the, Towards the very end, um, there's this line uh, talking about the Virgin Mary um, with the Christ child, you know, sweet babe, sh saying she. Um, and there's just sort of this like really wonderful kind of moment of, of dissonance uh, in, in the whole choir. Um, and there's just something that's really exciting about that. I don't know. Um, so I always look forward to that chord um, when we all just sort of, you know, stop on she. Um, and there's something that feels a little... I don't know, almost sort of transcendental about it, where sort of everything just sort of stops for a second. Um, so I, I look forward to that. Briefly, Helen, Nick? I think my favourite piece in the programme is just probably the one that takes us the furthest away from our comfort zone in Clare Chapel, which is the arrangement of Walking in a Winter Wonderland. <laughs> and it's also just really fun to see everybody get their heads out of copies. We know it now, and we can all just have... Uh, a lot of fun with it on stage, tell the story, and just hopefully bring that across to everyone watching. Uh, mine is going to shock you, but it's Tchaikovsky's <laughs> <laughs> Crown of Roses. Um, yeah, I think this piece is just, it shows, Tchaikovsky doesn't write a lot of uh, vocal music, um, so to find this is quite um, interesting, and um, it shows how he knows how to sort of write, um, I don't want to glorify him, but it shows he knows how to sort of bring the melody around as well. So if you're listening to the piece, perhaps sometimes divert your attention away from the soprano, so you usually get the melody. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting piece in that, in, that, in that way. And a rather special treat for us this evening is that we're going to be joined on stage for a few items by the relatively newly formed Wiltshire Youth Choir. And I love being able to make Clare College Choir collaborate with um, some local groups and we had a rehearsal together this afternoon and there's some very bright, young, talented singers who are going to join us on stage uh, and you'll hear a little bit more from them later, but it's a great joy to have them with us as well. So maybe just to, for anyone who's perhaps not familiar with the setup of the undergraduate choir that we have at Clare, or predominantly undergraduate choir, uh, <laughs> All of the um, students have to be members of Cambridge University unless they have a position in the choir like a, a lay clerk or a, a choir administrator. And they are all studying different academic subjects. I, I've lost count of the number of times that I've been asked the question of are everyone in your choir, are they all music students? Or I should say it's usually Americans who ask me are they all music majors? Um, yes, some of them are musicians, but lots of them are studying other different subjects, theology, sciences, veterinary medicine. And they come together to sing three, four times a week, doing something that hopefully they love and that they enjoy. But for a lot of them, that is not actually their principal reason of study. So it's something that they do in addition. And it's a big commitment on top of what they do in their studies. The singers can be expected to give up to around about 10 hours a week of contact time for our services and for the rehearsals. And of course, at a time of year like this, it, it's considerably more than that as we, we take on more events. Typically, they're in the choir for their three years that they're studying at Clare, and we're supported by two organ scholars who are also students, and you'll see them this evening, Samuel and Daniel, who are in their third and first years, respectively, and they, they play this evening the piano, but uh, they also play, of course, the organ in our chapel. We 
give our services in our chapel, but we also give concerts like we're doing here this evening. Um, we go on tour. We tend to tour internationally at least once or twice a year. And as I mentioned, we're just about to head to the Netherlands uh, in just over a week's time for a set of Christmas concerts there, leading us up to Christmas Eve. And we took the choir to Denmark in the spring, just gone to collaborate with the Alborg Symphony Orchestra in the north of Jutland. And next year, we're off to America in April to do our first trip there since the pandemic. So we're looking forward to that very much. Would there be at this point any questions that any of our audience wanted to ask any of us? And it can be as intelligent or as mundane as you like. Don't feel that you have to uh, hold back. We won't hold that against you. Yes. Now that the colleges are no longer single sex, do you have boys in your choir? That's a very good question. So for those joining us on the live stream, the question was, do we still have boys in Clare College Choir? There used to be boys in Clare College Choir. We're talking in the 1950s. And they were just gathered from the centre of Cambridge. They weren't anything to do with the college and they played football together and then they sang. And by all accounts, it was pretty rough music making. Uh, it was a little bit rough and ready around the edges. But um, Clare College, in fact, this very year, is celebrating a major anniversary for us because it's been 50 years since our co-education. In uh, 1972 is when we went to co-ed. So this year we have 50 years of celebrating that, which also means we have 50 years of a mixed voice choir. So the short answer is no, we don't have boy uh, travels in our choir. We've had a mixed voice choir here at Clare since those early 70s. And actually, even in the 60s, it tended to be a choir just of male undergraduates making alto tenors and basses. So there are part books in our library in Clare full of an extraordinary amount of repertoire just for altos, tenors and basses, which I confess we don't revisit that often because I think the sopranos might kill me. But um, yeah, we used to have boys, but no longer. In fact, the only boy trebles who sing in Cambridge now are at King's College, Cambridge, next door to us, at St John's College, Cambridge, in addition to girl choristers uh, and, and, women. and women in the back row as well. And I think there's boy choristers in Jesus as well, that's right. So it's just those, just those three choirs. Yeah. And then there's, there's girls at St. Catharines and Pembroke. Uh, yes, yeah. But only, only girls, no, no boys. And I remember talking to John Rutter about this because he was instrumental in creating the mixed voice choir that we have at Clare. He was director of music at Clare from 1975 to 1979. So he was there, if you like, after three years of the college having admitted women, it had taken enough time then for there to be a steady flow of them and it not just to be a, a one-year intake. And really we have John to thank for establishing the mixed voice sound of Claire that you'll hear this evening. And then of course his successor, my predecessor, Timothy Brown, who ran the choir for an extraordinary 31 years when I started at Clare College, that was um, seven years more than I'd been alive. And uh, he did a tremendous job in raising the profile of Clare College Choir, and indeed raising the profile of the college. They became the first mixed voice choir in Oxbridge to perform at the BBC Proms. We collaborated with all sorts of wonderful orchestras, conductors and choirs around the world. And um, yeah, so we've enjoyed this mixed voice uh, setup that we have. And next term, maybe someone else can speak so I don't speak all the time, tell us, Helen, what's happening next term for our celebrations in the 50th anniversary. So as part of the 50th anniversary, both for the college and the choir, uh, Graham has uh, kindly commissioned uh, four new pieces, uh, which are all either by alum, alumni of the college or by uh, living female composers like Cecilia McDowell. So one of the pieces you will hear tonight is a new piece of hers that she wrote for the choir, which we recorded for a BBC even, uh, sorry, Epiphany Carol service that will be broadcast in early January. The other three pieces are all going to be premiered in our next academic term, which I'm greatly looking forward to. Alongside the new commissions, uh, we always hold a pre-evensong recital on Sundays, which takes place just before half past five and throughout the next academic term these have been carefully curated so we have uh, 
more recent alumni from Clare College who are composers coming back and we're having a spotlight on some of their works, as well as performers such as Ellen Manahan thomas is going to come back and join us for a, a pre-even song recital with Elizabeth Kenny, who is a world-class lute player, and then both Elizabeth and Ellen will join us for the service to perform some really fantastic music. So it, there's a lot to look forward to next time. Super, were there any other questions from anyone in our audience? Most of the Cambridge colleges now have choirs, and indeed most have chapels. So I think I'm right in saying there are 31 colleges in Cambridge, and most of those have their own choir. And that's a kind of extraordinary statistic, because for any of us who know Cambridge, we'll know that it's about one square mile. And I think one of the things that I find the most moving in the job that I do is at quarter past six on a Tuesday and a Thursday and at six o'clock on a Sunday when we, we line up in our anti-chapel and we're just about to go in for our service, there's something very touching about thinking that there are 30 other colleagues and 30 other choirs doing exactly the same thing at almost exactly the same time. And we all do our slightly different format. Each choir has their own sound, they have their own setup, they have their own director of music, they have their own repertoire choices. And yes, of course, they're all largely similar. Most of us are singing similar repertoire. But I think that there are individual traits of each different choir. What is Clare College's trait? Well, I would say for a start, obviously, it's a mixed voice choir. That's the, that's the obvious setup. Um, I would say, as Nick pointed out, uh, we tend to do quite a lot of new music alongside traditional repertoire. Um, I would say that the sound of Clare College Choir that I try to foster is one where the singers listen carefully and blend to each other, but also don't feel inhibited in their sound, and that they can then sing. And I've always had the philosophy that if you program, for example, a motet by Thomas Tallis and an anthem by Johannes Brahms, I actively don't want those two pieces to sound the same. I don't want my singers to sing Tallis in the way that they sing Brahms and vice versa. And I think part of the joy about what we do is honing our sound to befit the repertoire that we sing. And I'm thinking, for example, there's going to be a piece that you'll hear at the start of our second half of tonight's programme by Samuel Barber which sets the most amazing text by Laurie Lee. And it asks the singers to be pretty demanding in their voices. And I should just say that um, you'll definitely hear it. <laughs> okay, well look, we're, we're out of time at the end of our talk, um, but all that remains for uh, me to say is a huge thanks to Nick and to Helen and to um, Julian, I was about to call you Justin, <laughs> Julian and Meg uh, for joining me on stage this evening. It's very um, wonderful for us to be here this evening. We're greatly looking forward to performing for you tonight. I will say just a little bit in the program later on, but um, thank you very much for coming to this talk. Have a good half hour off. Thank you to those joining online, and we'll see you at half past seven. Thank you.